the way the group started, still Future Group is what we were calling ourselves, uh, we all kind of uh, met together in Edinburgh from various different places. All being artists, all in a smallish city, we all kind of found a certain kind of dialogue or, or uh, some sort of overlap in each of our work, which kind of um, just organically formed into this kind of, you know, this bond as a group. The commonality probably between uh, you know, each, each artist is, is there's some sort of political uh, background. And that's where the dialogue comes in, that's where the debate starts to happen. The first impressions that we could like to have uh, for the viewer, for the people that are, are coming to see the exhibition, is that there is uh, some sort of negotiation between ourselves, the artists, and the viewer, because the viewer um, is not a kind of passive person within this situation. We're kind of hoping that the viewer is going to bring some sort of baggage to the work, and by that, they will create almost another meaning um, to the work because we're reliant on the viewer to, in some senses, uh, ignite the work. We're not really expecting the viewer to come walking into the space and passively see some nice pictures on the wall and then walk away after having a kind of uh, a comfortable uh, five minutes or 50 minutes in the gallery. Um, or hoping there's going to be some energy as a result of it. Feed the Rich is, I guess, an attempt to bring uh, a piece of performance work from the street into a gallery space. Uh, Feed the Rich is basically a, a performance piece which I've been touring around the UK. It's me attempting to, uh, to give food, free food, to wealthy people coming out of luxury branded shops in the high street. So I'll set up a small food station with stovies that I've prepared with the help of, uh, of kind of homeless charities, food banks and what have you who donate this food to me. I'll prepare the food the, the day before and then I'll site myself directly in the firing line, if you will, of a luxury brand shop. So, uh, for example, in Soho or in Edinburgh, um, I'll, uh, I'll stand outside uh, Harvey Nicks or Louis Vuitton shop and try and hand out this food to rich people who generally completely ignore me. Because I think the three works work together, okay, so they're all about, they, they're all talking about, they're all in the space of ideas of wealth and the, that disparity between those who have and those who don't have. Generally speaking, I'm quite particular about people being able to get to the, the nub of my message very, very quickly. So a lot of the slogans that I work with are very obvious, if you will. The paintings which I've made for the exhibition were basically taking their inspiration from the, a drawing which I saw by Leo Baxendale, who was one of the key artists in the creation of the Backstreet Kids. And there was something about the quality of the drawing, the invention and the humour, and also the detail that was present in the Baxendale piece, which really, really inspired me. Um, and I, in that way, it made me think about taking on some kind of urban um, scene and then trying to load it with um, some kind of narrative content. The paintings are trying to articulate some kind of Marxist dialectic through the five panels. The final panel is intended to show a synthesis, if you like, where some kind of social resolution or um, equilibrium is, is achieved between the characters. So the, the kind of human interaction of two men, which they've now become, they've, they're now not sharks, they're now not behaving in a vicious manner, but they've become human again. Um, is hopefully there to sort of represent, certainly in my mind, something to do with the local, something to do with the human, and something, a communication, a simple communication, but a loaded one which isn't bogus, and that that interaction is, has a currency which is, is about um, a value set, rather than the kind of bogus, fatic communion or language that we find in the media. In regard to the wood pieces, the wooden objects which I've created, 
again, they're really just simply a critique of academia or, if you like, uh, educational system. Really, they're, they're an attempt to craft an object, maybe a, like, if you like, a sort of folk object in inverted commas, and the idea of creating something which is accessible to hopefully the wide, wide audience. No one, hopefully, is excluded from the dialogue. Everyone can engage with these pieces. Hopefully, again, there's a craft, there's a skill level, as is hopefully evident in the paintings. Um, and that, that then can hopefully entice the viewer in, hook them into some kind of dialogue or interaction with the piece, um, and that the, hopefully the audience can recognise the quality and some of the thinking behind the object, and that hopefully, therefore, it becomes something of value or meaning to the audience. All the drawings were drawings from my windows. I live on the 20th floor of a tower block in London, quite close to the river overlooking the city of London. The drawing in the show is a drawing of my unborn child. It's where we perceived she was going to be born, which was in Westminster. So, and it's kind of like a bomb going off, and it links the child to the ground, like the umbilical cord moving into the earth. So it's a kind of imagination of Elsie before she was born through a, through a kind of CAT scan. And the motifs from the drawings, the kind of, I suppose, the visions from the drawings had made into banners, standards, and kind of trying to associate that with nationhood. And also time, how time develops, or how time changes something. The whole piece is about time, the whole piece is about the process of time, the passing of time, the development of time, the relationship between the past and the future. The, the flag in the middle, which is, which is obviously a white flag, is kind of a surrender to, to a perception, a surrender to an acceptance of the past to move into a future. But also for me, it's like a sensitivity to the material, a kind of a, an idea of a, a relationship to, to history of, of the materiality, which is the textiles, which I initially studied years ago as my first degree, which I'm kind of moving back into oh, that means of expression. I think the, the, the means of expression is quite undersung as a materiality. It's not a painting. Embroidery is important historically. That's what I'd like people to take away as seeing something made in that materiality and um, making that material, the embroidery, the embroidery aspect of it, become heightened, more important. Not more important than painting, but it's to be seen on the kind of equal level to painting. It's a story about some people who have an idea that everyone should have enough to eat, a warm, peaceful place to sleep, and no real fear of what's around the corner. Seeking some security, they begin to work together, growing food in the fertile soil around their homes. An understanding arises between them, a warmth towards one another, and they support each other. But the world is blighted by others, swollen with power and wealth, who have become giants. For these liars of earth, the world is like a model, and they manipulate it to their advantage without care for others. They do what they want. They have control. They own the mines, factories, oil fields, outlets, the whole process. They work the politicians. They run the media. They get what they want. They have it sewn up. They squeeze the people. They squeeze the government. They use the people. And the people are sick of being used. They're sick of the lies and the dreams they're sold. They're sick of living on crumbs, of having to scramble for what trickles off the giant's tables. They're sick of being subject to an iron law which the giants are above. So they've worked together, cooperating closely to secure supplies of fresh food, and their confidence and belief in one another has grown and awoken slumbering reserves of courage and intelligence. This new strength is gathered in great forms of humanity from their shared stories and myths. Together they have begun a levelling which will bring the giants down to size and lay the foundation for a harmonious future.
I've got two pieces of work in the, the exhibition and um, generally speaking I kind of like to ask a lot of questions about what it means to be an artist. You know, the idea of the artist as we understand it today is a relatively new understanding. It's only been going around for the last few hundred years where we, we look to the artist and the psyche of the artist or, or you know, the mind of the artist and what they're trying to say and, and what's going on. It's not just about the craft. And what I've done is I've, I've copied work slavishly copied it, so I've kind of tried to take out some of the creative mark-making processes that traditionally goes on with, uh, with say, sort of two-dimensional work. And uh, I've juxtaposed that with some YouTube videos. The way I've done that is, is to use the titles of certain YouTube videos. So what I'm actually doing there is, is having two different things, bringing them together and try to create a, create a, trying to create a third meaning. And that third meaning generally is, is is activated by the viewer because the space between the title and the actual kind of uh, two-dimensional sort of thing in the wall, um, they are distinct in themselves, but um, it's my intention that the viewer is the one that activates meaning between the title and the, the picture. Well, my work's quite simple in essence. I mean, my project is to take poetry and put it in public space. Essentially, I started working on billboards as a medium because I was really annoyed by the way billboards treat us as idiots. And I wanted to see if I could take the space of billboards and use it for something else completely different, which is the interior voice of poetry. I'm somewhere between being a poet and a contemporary artist. I'm probably both at the same time, actually. I think of myself as an artist who uses poetry, though. So I wanted to see if I could join on to that tradition in a sense, but bring the voice of my text a bit closer to contemporary poetry. So I write in a slightly awkward poetic style, and I write about ecology and the city and you know what I think is our collective unconscious. A piece like the big light piece we have here is a really personal piece to me and I think it sort of becomes personal to lots of other people. I wrote it in 2006 as part of a sort of grieving process for my a really close friend from art school who died in 2004 and I was with him when he died. He died in a, in a car accident and I had a dream, I think, where Sean seemed alive about a year later or something and the dream seemed like a joy, actually. And as part of the grieving process, the dream felt like something quite joyous, not th something sad. And I woke up having had the experience that he was still alive, and I, I really loved it. I woke up happy, essentially. And it made me think about ghosts and our, our idea of ghosts, and how in Christian culture we've made ghosts a sort of bad thing. I, I wondered if maybe just the memory, the vivid dream memory of someone you loved coming back to you in sleep is actually what we called ghosts once, and if it wasn't more of a positive thing than we think. So in a way, it's a really simple text, but what it suggests is that we rethink the idea of ghost into perhaps being a positive idea. It's as simple as that, really. There's two themes, I suppose. The first is the more serious aspect of a wall being something which separates people. I'm thinking mainly perhaps of the most iconic of all, which is the Berlin Wall. Perhaps if you look back to 2013, when there was the referendum about whether Scotland should be an independent country. For the first time, the various walls which perhaps have been built historically between Scotland and England might actually work as a metaphor as well. Scotland wants to build a wall of sorts, not, not in the sense of keeping out people so much, but in the sense of having the sort of confidence which will allow them to operate as a country on their own. Once again, there's this notion that there's some degree of separation, and of course it being shortbread as well, the shortbread perhaps is, if you like, a little kind of comical nod 
to the fact that um, shortbread is something which is historically and perhaps a little bit cliched is a notion of what Scotland's famous for, along with kilts and highland cows and so on and so forth. In a way, it's a, it's a small sort of comical look at that. And then, perhaps even more from a, from a comical point of view, is the idea that when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, for a long time afterwards, there was this kind of strange economy of people selling bits of, of the Berlin Wall. So perhaps there is going to be this kind of notion going around people's heads saying, you know, I'm just going to, while no one's looking, chisel off a little bit of this wall and um, keep it. And then, of course, eat it as well. <laughs>